Hi everybody, thanks again for joining us on our virtual field trip here with Clearwater Marine Aquarium. And welcome to our Race to the Ocean segment all about sea turtle hatchlings or baby sea turtles and the hazards that they face. My name is Caitlin, I work here in our education department at CMA, but I also volunteer with our sea turtle conservation program. And so that sea turtle conservation comprised of about two dozen individuals who are both staff, volunteer, and interns throughout our nesting season. So thinking about sea turtles, nesting season here in Pinellas County on the west coast of Florida next to the Gulf of Mexico lasts from May 1st through October 31st. We typically have loggerhead sea turtles laying eggs on our beaches and so to kind of start things off we're going to talk about sea turtle um, the life cycle. So starting with those mamas, they're going to be miles out in the Gulf of Mexico in their feeding and mating grounds. And when that mama sea turtle is ready to come ashore, she's going to crawl her way up the sand, up shore, right? And she's going to search for that perfect area to lay her eggs. If you remember in our sea turtle anatomy, we talked about sea turtles being reptiles and laying soft, leathery eggs. Keep in mind, those eggs will fall into a hole. So if they were hard like chicken eggs, they would crack. So that's a great adaptation for our sea turtles, having those soft leathery eggs. Once she finds the perfect spot, she's gonna use her rear or back flippers to dig what we call an egg chamber or the hole, where she's going to deposit anywhere from 80 to 120 eggs. Once she's done depositing those eggs, she's gonna use her front flippers, kind of cover them up with nice fluffy warm sand and then she's going to leave. Our sea turtle mamas do not help raise their young. Instead, those baby sea turtles are born with all of the survival instincts they need to be successful out in the wild. So those turtles are gonna spend about two months kind of incubating or staying nice and warm in the sand in their egg chamber. Now, partly through their development, that's when we're going to have uh, boys and girls develop. Now, keep in mind, we like to say warm chicks, cool dudes. So those warmer temperatures are going to yield more girls sea turtles, and those cooler temperatures, maybe towards the bottom of that egg chamber, are going to yield more boys. After those two months, when those babies are ready to hatch out of their eggs, they're gonna use what we call their caruncle, or their egg tooth, to break open that nice soft leathery egg, and then all emerge together, that emergence activity that we see um, sometimes in videos, which is really exciting. That's when they come out of the sand, ideally about this. There's always safety in numbers, right? And it's gonna happen under the cover of darkness. So ultimately, those hatchlings are going to use celestial light or light from the moon and stars that are reflecting off of that water in order to find their way to the ocean, or in our case on the west coast of Florida, the Gulf of Mexico. So once those sea turtles reach the water line or high tide line in the Gulf, they're going to continue on swimming maybe for several days until they find what's called the sargasm line or the weed line. There, those hatchlings are going to gain strength which is one uh, reason why it's really important that they find that line. As they get bigger, the sargasm line, of course, has uh, lots of nutrients there, whether it's the uh, sargasm itself or maybe some shrimp that are living within the sargasm. And then it's also going to offer a protection from predators, things like birds and sharks that may be looking uh, for a snack. So their carapace or back shell is nice and dark in color and their bellies are nice and light. That's something we call counter shading. Uh, that's one camouflage that they can use in order to stay safe from those predators. But we're gonna go ahead and head downstairs and check out our nesting patrol team and learn a little bit more about what we do here at the aquarium to help conserve our endangered species. Hi everybody, I'm down here uh, next to our Stingray Beach and Mavis's rescue hideaway at our sea turtle nesting display sign. 
So throughout our season, we do like to keep our guests up to date uh, with what's going on. So of course, right now we are not open to the public. However, uh, once we are, you'll see this board uh, updated on a regular basis. Right now it's nice and clean because we're getting ready for nesting season to start. Uh, we'll actually be beginning our patrol mid-April just in case there are any early mamas coming up, uh, which has been the case in on the west coast, or sorry, we're on the west coast, on the east coast of Florida, those big leather back sea turtles that we talked about um, in our sea turtle species segment have come up about three weeks earlier than expected. Uh, so we're very excited to start our nesting season here shortly. And what I have behind me is our display kind of explaining um, a little bit about what we're looking for and what we do. So on a daily basis, we're of course getting up very, very early. We start before sunrise every morning and we monitor roughly 13 miles of shoreline. So here in this map, you can see where Caladesi State Park starts. So we don't actually patrol that area, the park rangers will, but we start on North Clearwater Beach and go all the way south through Indian Shores. Now, of course, being about 12 miles long, that's a very lengthy area to survey. So we break that up into three separate segments, uh, make sure that we patrol those every single day. And what we're looking for specifically in the beginning portion of our nesting season is going to be signs of nesting activity from those mama sea turtles coming up. And you might be wondering, well, Caitlin, what are signs of nesting activity? That's a great question. It's going to be the flipper marks that she leaves. So again, we mostly have loggerhead sea turtles nesting on our shoreline. And some characteristics about loggerhead flipper marks is one, they are comma shaped and two, they alternate. So in this photograph down here, you can see that they alternate. So they're not completely lined up here, 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 as we move forward. So that alternating gait basically just means that they kind of wiggle. So if you have a dog at home, if your dog likes to wiggle when they get super excited, kind of think about our loggerheads like that. Um, obviously they're not super excited and happy. Instead, those mamas are looking for an area to nest. Um, but those are signs, and we can even tell which direction she's crawling by the tracks. So if you see those comma shapes, the curve of a comma is going to kind of dictate where her flippers were last. So we can tell incoming and outgoing uh, crawl. Now, sometimes while she's out there at night, there might be people, there might be an animal, there might be something that causes her to turn around and go back to the water, or maybe it's just not the right spot for her. She just doesn't like that area for whatever reason. So that's something that we call a false crawl, where she comes up and then she leaves. So another species that nests on Florida beaches are of course our green sea turtles. Now we don't typically see them in our survey area, um, but they do come up on sh uh, Florida beaches to nest. And so if you take a look at our crawl tracks, we can distinguish them apart from loggerhead sea turtles by the length of the crawl track. So it may be a little bit longer. You can see the flipper marks here tend to be a little bit bigger they're also going to be even. They don't have that alternating gait. And that lady sea turtle, she's going to leave a tail drag or tail mark right in the center of those uh, crawl tracks. So each morning when we go out patrolling, looking for those signs of nesting activity, when we do find what we believe to be a nest, uh, we follow those crawl tracks up. And typically there's a nice fluffy mound of sand. We're gonna go ahead and mark that area off with four nesting stakes, kind of like the ones that we saw up in the classroom. One of them had a nice sign on it that does have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission phone number, the hotline, just in case you see anything, uh, maybe later on visiting beaches, that may look a little suspect. Maybe somebody's disturbing a nest, maybe something's just not quite right. We do wanna keep in mind that our species are endangered. So unless you have special permission, just like our patrol team does um, to handle these animals, you wanna make sure you 
in order to get a hold of somebody. So that would be FWC's number or perhaps the phone number of the aquarium and our rescue um, extension is the number one. Being a working rescue hospital, that's our top priority. So we wanna make sure we can get out um, and help those animals quickly and safe. So when we do see the signs of nesting activity, those flipper marks in the sand, what we're going to do is go ahead and mark off that area with nesting stakes that you may have seen upstairs in our classroom. And one of those stakes does have a sign on it that of course lets everybody know that may be in the area that it's actually illegal to disturb these animals. Being a federally protected species, we want to make sure that we're not doing anything we're not supposed to. That being said, of course, our nesting patrol team here with our sea turtle conservation program are all on a special permit provided to us through FWC in order to conduct all activity on our beach. So after we mark off that nest, we're gonna go ahead and continue on patrolling every single day when we're out on the beaches looking for new signs of activity we're still checking on every nest that we marked off trying to ensure that there are no signs of disturbance now that's going to happen towards the beginning of the season and then later on in the season that's where things get really exciting and tend to get very, very cute because we're going to be looking for when those hatchlings emerge out of their nest, they're going to be crawling towards the water ideally. And so they're going to leave those little flipper marks, but sea turtle hatchlings are about the size of a chicken nugget with flippers. So they're quite literally about this big. <laughs> itty bitty. So there are a lot of things that our sea turtles have to combat while they're trying to make their way to the water. Keep in mind, only one in a thousand sea turtles on average make it to adulthood in order to come back to their beaches, uh, especially if they're ladies, to continue the population through nesting activity. But we're going to kick it up to Paul and Taylor out on our dolphin terrace to learn a little bit more about those hazards our hatchlings face. Hey everyone, I'm here with Paul, one of our biologists as part of the sea turtle conservation program. And Paul, we're going to talk a little bit about sea turtle nesting and what you guys can do. So I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Taylor. Um, so sea turtle nesting season is approaching here and hatchlings and nests alike have lots of hazards out there. Um, not just predators, which predators in this area can be things like coyotes or raccoons, even ants. Um, they can get into a nest and they can get some of those eggs or ghost crabs as well. Um, and another big issue in this area is lighting. So we have lots of condos and hotels on their beaches. You can kind of see behind me, we have lots of buildings back there. And some of those bright lights from those buildings can actually lead hatchlings the wrong way. We call that a disorientation. And that's because hatchlings use the light from the stars and the moon reflecting off of the ocean in order to find the water. So if they see a light source that's brighter than that, they're gonna go the wrong way sometimes. So lots of hazards out there, but things you can do to help hatchlings is when you're at the beach, just don't leave anything behind because those can be obstructions for hatchlings trying to reach the water, things like beach chairs or um, whatever fun toys you have out there. You wanna make sure you take everything with you uh, when you leave the beach. And then also things like sand castles and holes. We might not think that's a problem, but hatchlings can fall into those holes. I've actually recovered hatchlings that have fallen into a hole some, sometime during the night and luckily they made it through the morning so we we're able to release them but they can get stuck in there very easily and sand castles also can be an obstruction just like those beach chairs where if they run into that sand castle they might think they're going the wrong way and they might actually turn around and actually go the wrong way so lots of hazards out there so just make sure you're knocking down those sand castles filling in those holes and leaving nothing behind and then if you happen to live on the beach make sure you're using sea turtle safe lighting that won't have them disorient and go the wrong direction Awesome. Well, thanks, Paul. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about sea turtle nesting and how we can protect them in just a minute. That was so awesome. Thank you, Paul, for that incredible information on our sea turtle hatchling hazards and also what we as humans can do when we do go out to visit our beaches. Um, we're going to go ahead and focus kind of on one in particular. Now, Paul mentioned that behind us we do have a variety of buildings and being heavily populated and developed here in Clearwater Beach area, there are condos, hotels, restaurants, and a variety of buildings that are situated on the beach and then even a couple blocks back. So we're going to talk about unnatural lighting. If you remember in the beginning of the segment, I mentioned that our baby sea turtles are going to be following celestial light. So moonlight and stars that reflect off of the water of the Gulf of Mexico as they're trying to make their way towards the water. And so what eventually happens because some of those 
are very bright and very pointed and not shielded, uh, they get disoriented. So they may turn and go towards those lights rather than the light of the moon because those lights are more powerful than moon and stars. And so a few things that we can do as humans are to keep it long, keep it low, and keep it shielded. So keep it long. We're talking about wavelengths of light. So if you ever take a prism and shine a light through, we're going to see all the colors of the rainbow. But rather than um, think about it in straight lines, I want you at home to think about the rainbow arches. So these shorter wavelengths, those are going to be the blue and the violet colors are going to disorient or disrupt our sea turtle activity more because those are what they, um, of course, those bright lights are what they're looking for. And we're gonna wanna keep the wavelengths long. So think about the nice long arch on the rainbow that's going to be red. We want our sea turtle friendly lights, which are red and amber tones out on our beaches as opposed to those bright white lights. We're gonna keep it low. Think about our lighting out there that we may have. It may be a light from the top floor of a parking garage. We don't want those super, super bright lights there because of course that's going to mimic the moon and again, cause those turtle hatchlings to crawl towards that as opposed to going to the water. So we wanna to try to keep those lights as low to the ground as possible. Now, of course, we do have to ensure the safety and well-being of the humans out on our beaches, um, but that is another reason why we wanna go ahead and shield that light. So if you ever take a flashlight at home, maybe a white light flashlight, turn the lights off in, your, in one room, and go ahead and shine that light on a wall. It's going to illuminate almost the entire wall, especially if you hit the center of it. Now, if you were to put tissue paper or maybe just a tissue in front of that light, that tissue is going to help disperse the light and it's going to diffuse it. So it's not as strong of a beam as it is without that shield. So again, that's why we wanna go ahead and shield that light from those sea turtles. Um, so that way, if they're amber tones, if it's shielded, it's not a point harsh source of lighting. Um, that way we can make sure that our sea turtles end up going to the water. Now that we've gone over disorientations caused by light pollution that is produced by beachfront properties, you may be wondering what exactly happens to those hatchlings that go the wrong way. As part of our patrol team, I can tell you from experience that our team can spend several hours on our beaches playing detective and looking for where those hatchlings may have ended up. Remember that our only clues are the tracks left behind by the turtles themselves. This is part of the reason why we begin our days so early in the morning. We want to ensure that we get out there before those tracks are inadvertently disturbed or erased by beachgoers. We will follow the tracks until we locate our hatchlings or until the tracks themselves end, which would indicate to us that the hatchling may have been picked up by a predator. When we locate the hatchlings, depending on their location and condition, we may release them or bring them back to the hospital. Upon their arrival to CMA, our vet team will assess the hatchlings condition and determine the best course of action. If they need to stay with us for a little while, we have a space dedicated specifically to hatchlings so that they are separated from the larger animals under our care at that time. Ultimately, the hatchlings who come to CMA will be released under conditions that most mimic their natural emergence activity. It is believed that these methods allow baby sea turtles to utilize their survival instincts and increase their survival rate. While females lay on average 100 eggs, only one out of a thousand will combat the hazards within the habitat and grow to be an adult. This is why CMA works hard every day throughout our nesting season to ensure the greatest success rate of both the females who lay the eggs and the hatchlings that emerge from the egg chamber. So I challenge you folks at home to once, go ahead and download the instructions for our hatchling hazard scheme, and then try to see if you would be successful as a hatchling making it out to the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us on another beautiful day here in Florida at our virtual field trip here at Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Thank you for your support, and I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your day.